I think a lot of people want change. I think a lot of people genuinely want to see the Holy Spirit move. But do a genuine amount of people want to do something about it? I find it amazing in today's world where it's so easy for people to find a cause. It's so easy for people to find a cause to rally for and to fight for. But who would rally and fight for righteousness sake? Who would stand for his great name? There's easy to have a cause because when we're wronged, when things come against us, when we're treated unfairly, when things happen at work, when things happen in our family, when things happen against it, how dare they do these things to us? How dare they do these things to us? But do we stand for his great name and do we stand for righteousness? What is the world seeking for today? You know, I think they want truth. I think people genuinely want happiness. I think people genuinely want peace. But where will they find it? Will they find it in the things of the world and will they find it in the things that rally against us? Of course not, because we know that the only place there is peace is in the centre of God. In his name, in who he is, he is shalom. He is peace. It emanates from him. It emanates from him. This morning, I'm sharing on actually a bit of a follow through and follow up with what Andrew was talking about on. I said to him, I said, you posed a great question. What are the questions God asks? And today I have another question of what God asks, but I'm just waiting on the Holy Spirit. Okay. I'm waiting on the Holy Spirit because I don't want to, on one hand, I don't want to just go hit with a hammer all the time because I want to see the Holy Spirit move, but on the other side of the coin without, on the other side of the coin without getting a foundation right, without calling things out and saying what it is, we're left in a false hope because we want to see God move. We want to see the God of breakthrough. We want to see the God that answers our prayers. We want to see the God that supplies our need. We want to see the God that gives us peace. We want to see the God that helps us in our situation. We want to see the God of the flood. We want to see the God that moves on our behalf, that stands before us. We want to move inside this bubble of God's presence. And yet so often we forget the first thing Jesus said. I want you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. I want you to give all that you have for God. Why? Why? I'm really going to go all over my notes today. Nothing is going to make sense. As far as my notes go, I've got pages of them. But it just so happens every now and then, God throws everything up in the air. Yeah, and that's okay. Let me ask you a question. Why do you love Jesus? Why are you a Christian? Why do you believe what you believe? Why should or why do you follow Jesus? And why should I follow Jesus? What is it about your faith that I could look at it and go, well, why should I follow Jesus? You got problems, I got problems. You got issues, I got issues. Things aren't working for you, things aren't working for me. Why should I follow Jesus? What's Jesus going to do for me? Why do you do what you do? Why do you do what you do? On Thursday night, on our devotions, I got sealed to read out a passage from, it was a, from a pastor on a forum, and so it was, this pastor was a mother, or is a mother, and I wanted to read this out again. 
She said, I once sat in a hospital room and watched my incoherent eight-year-old boy battle a life-threatening intracranial blood clot. I was oddly calm. I clung to the goodness of God and did my best to trust that he, that God, held my son in his hands. At that point, it was essentially my only option. At that point, it was essentially my only option. There were no more decisions to make, no actions I could take, and nothing I could control. There was nothing this woman could control. Her eight-year-old boy was suffering from an intracranial blood clot. My boss, the bloke I bought my first motorbike jacket from, my first, one of my bosses, my first boss actually, um, he had an operation on his legs and a blood clot. They missed the blood clot. The irony was he was getting his veins fixed up so he could do a long motorbike ride. And the doctors told him to stand up and he stood up and the blood clot moved and he passed away. Serious. This is a serious thing. And this mum is saying, I am left at the options of God. I am left at the mercy of God. What can happen? Everything else. I can't do anything about this but fall at the mercy of God. Peter at our men's coffee night on Friday was sharing about how he got hit by a truck, walked behind the bus as a young child, and he saw himself. He saw himself going the ambulance, isn't that right, Peter? And the ambulance and that going away. He was sharing that, how God's hand was there. I have a friend who sadly I grew up with has passed away, but he was a child and his mother had just got saved and they were going to Garden City Church and they'd left England because of the, um, the mob, basically, in the 60s, 50s, 60s. And um, they were, this was Stuart, Stuart Harley. Yeah, Marie will know them. And Stuart was just a little boy. And he was standing in the street corner in Brisbane, I think it was, or in the valley, he said. And this valiant charger came bursting around the corner for anyone who's young enough will remember the commercials. Hey, charger. And this valiant charger bowled him over. He had blood coming out everywhere and he went to the hospital. They were praying. And they called the pastor of Garden City Church at the time to come and pray for Stuart. The dad wasn't a Christian. The mum was a Christian and Brenda was at the mercy of God saying, Lord, Lord, would you do something? There is nothing I can do in this situation. There is nothing I can do in this situation except be at this place before you and say, God, 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 would you move? Would you move? As it turned out, the father came in who wasn't saved and said to the pastor, if something happens to my son, I'm going to kill you. Mind you, the father was an ex-boxer, um, underworld bloke, and he could have done it. He had the capacity. God miraculously healed Stuart. Miraculously healed every part. Whole, healed. His father fell down and gave his life to the Lord. See, when we place ourselves, it's a position we do not want to be in. And yet we find ourselves there time and time again. I have no choice, but I must place myself in this position with God. I must place myself in this position with God. The mother continued to write, it's easy to look back at times of seemingly big faith where I let go of things I never really had and foolishly pat myself on the back, on the back a little and think, hey, I got this. I was faithful. It worked. Only to be blindsided as I fall apart during my much smaller trials, the ones that require me to make decisions, solve problems, or actually do things based on my beliefs. We see true two stri uh, trains of thought, two streams of action happening here. There is one stream where God, there is nothing I can do and God must 
move. Who's ever been in a situation like that? There is nothing I can do. God, I need you. It is physically impossible for me to do anything but fall at your feet and say, Lord, have mercy on me. And then there's this other strain and stream that we walk in where we're able to do things and how much do we trust on what we can do, what we are able to do, how we are able to move, how we are able to move and shift and do things. And this lady found out that every time she moved into this part, how lost she was getting how totally and utterly lost she was getting into this place and unable to move. Foolishly being blindsided, she said. Now, not even a year later, I'm losing my temper with that now nine-year-old boy as he fights with his brother or makes one of his little sisters cry. I'm weary from a hard move that's not finished, Worried about a house that needs to sell so we can join my husband in a different state at a new job. Stressed about finances and the future. Losing my cool over a leaking washing machine. <laughs> Been there. And a kitchen being taken over by ants. Wow. It's these little things that just seem to be getting on top of her. These little things that just seem to be grabbing a hold of her. Concerned that my offspring are planning a coup d'etat in response to my obvious weakness and lack of leadership. This poor mum. Let me tell you people, in my house, there are several coup d'etats. That when your boys get older, Mike, when your son gets older, him and Sophie will plot. They will scheme. And they will, I'm sorry Nadine, listen to every word you say, and they will plan, and it's like this switch inside them goes, how can we get mum? It happens, it happens. It's actually hilarious. <laughs> when the two boys, <laughs> when the two boys are ganging up on Seal. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, the three of us here. Yeah. Listen to what she says. I feel far from God. My quiet times, when they happen, seem rote. Rote, repetitive learning, just speaking, repetitive. Have you had your quiet times where you just feel like you're hitting a brick wall? Have you had your quiet times where you say, righto, I am going to do business with God. I'm going to get into God and I'm going to, yeah, 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 yeah. And it's like everything is just bouncing back and hitting you in the face. You ever had those times? I said to Waz, he said, um, are you, um, you being okay this week? And I said, oh, I've been doing some warfare this week. And yesterday I went for a drive as I do. I went for two drives. Two nice long drives, praying in tongues, asking God my questions. And the second one, I said to see what time we've got to go out tonight. And, and I said, okay, I knew I had to be home. So I planned my drive, driving along. And then wouldn't you know it? There is silence from God. Silence. And I'm driving in and I go, oh, well, I guess you'll tell me when you're ready. And I've hit the blinker to turn into our estate. As soon as I've turned in, he spoke. I did think straight away, wow, you could have told me this this morning. <laughs> yeah. There are times where our quiet time is amazing, amazing, amazing. And there are other times where our quiet times seem like we're just hitting a brick wall. That God is, it's like God is deaf. You ever said that to the Lord? Lord, are you deaf? Can you not hear me? Is there something coming back here? I need an answer. I need an answer. I think he must laugh at us sometimes. I feel far from God. My quiet times when they happen seem rote and shallow. My prayers feel weak. I'm stripped 
of my usual security and home and church community and ministry and my support system. And what's left isn't pretty. My soul is at war. Do you know that your spirit can be great? Your spirit can be soaring, but your soul, your soul can be at war. Your soul can be at conflict. Your soul can be at a place where it's stretched left and right and moving. The emotions inside is getting torn to bits, but your spirit can be good. That's why the Lord tells us, they were to love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, body, soul, and spirit. There's a picture I'm gonna show sometime this year and do some messages on it that talk about how much we actually spend in the soul realm instead of in the spirit realm. That as Christians today, I think we spend most of our time in the soul realm because it feels good. It feels good. And the Lord is shouting, I didn't ask you to feel good. I asked you to walk by faith. But it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel inside. I don't have that witness. I don't know if I should do this. It doesn't feel good. She says, here I am collapsing under the pressure of a move, an ants and some immediate uncertainty. Why? Why? Is the God I place my trust in at the moment of my salvation any less good when I'm navigating my second hour in line at the DMV or the main roads department? Is the God I place my trust in at the moment of my salvation any less good when my children are crying? Is the God I put my trust in at the moment of my salvation any less good when there are financial pressures? Is the God I put my trust in at the moment of my salvation any less good when there is a healing I'm waiting for, where there is a breakthrough I'm waiting for, where there is an answer I'm waiting for? Is the God I put my trust in any less good? No, of course not. Of course not. It's impossible for him to change. Even though I'd still vehemently defend God's absolute sovereignty. Now listen to this line. Even though I still vehemently, vehemently defend God's absolute sovereignty, she says, my actions often reveal an unbelief that speaks louder than words. My actions often reveal an unbelief that speaks louder than my words. That so often our actions betray us. Our mouth will say one thing, our heart will say another, but our actions are just moving on their own. And they betray us because they're, are they moving in the actions of what God is saying or are they actually moving in a natural knowledge? See, natural knowledge is what we fight against all the time. At the Garden of Eden, we have Adam and Eve standing there. And the serpent, the Bible says that the serpent came to Eve and he said, did God really say? Did God really say? They're in this environment where everything is perfect. They're in this environment where everything is provided for. They're in this environment where they are walking with God. They're walking with God in the cool of the day. They're walking with God. And that sneaky so-and-so comes up and said, did God really say? Did God really say you're an overcomer? Did God really say you're gonna get through this? Did God really say you're gonna be healed? Did God really say your kids are gonna be okay? Did God really say that this isn't come against you. And then he'll go, did God really say this is gonna happen? Because you know, remember so-and-so? They said God said, and look what happened to them, it didn't work. Remember so-and-so? 
They said it was going to be good and, and they still suffered. Remember when this thing happened and this spoke against, see, there is a spirit of the age that would speak a worldly knowledge that speaks into our lives, a natural knowledge. And Eve responded to this natural knowledge and said, oh, God said we couldn't look at it and touch it. Did he really say you couldn't touch it? He had her. The moment Eve misinterpreted what God said, the moment she didn't listen properly to what the Spirit of God was saying and she shifted it around and misinterpreted it, he said, did God really say? Well, he said you didn't touch it. He said, really? Really, Eve? Perhaps he nudged her along and perhaps there was just grab. Well, I'm not dead. I'm not dead yet. Nothing's happened. So if I can touch it and I'm not dead, maybe I can taste it and not die. See, this has been fighting against humanity all the way since then, and it still fights us today. But what has God called us to be as Christians? He's called us to be overcomers. So I ask that question again, why should I follow Jesus? What is it about you that tells me I should follow Jesus? What is it about you and what do you carry? You seem to be having the same problems, the same issues. Do you know your why? This lady said, when my mind is consumed with my bank account, I'm believing that money provides my security rather than my saviour. When I yell at my children for leaving a mess, for leaving a mess I need to clean, I'm believing that my comfort comes from an orderly house. Beck, I'm believing my comfort comes from an orderly house rather than from the God of all comfort. When I become despondent over an uncertain future and lack of stability, I'm failing to believe that I'm merely a pilgrim and this is not my home. Every hour that goes by, I fail to pray and cry out to God is an hour that I'm telling him, oh, oh, this is. Every hour that goes by that I fail to pray and cry out to God is an hour I'm telling him, it's okay, I've got this. (laughs) And then she writes in the last line. And then I hypocritically wonder, How did I get here? How did I get here? How did I get here? See, if you're in church long enough and you stay in church, sadly, not too long these days, but it used to be if you're in church long enough, you would eventually meet someone who will say, no, I'm done with this. This isn't working. We know lots of people who have left church And what I always fail to understand is not so much the leaving church, it's the walking away from God. I fail to understand how someone could get offended, hurt, mistreated, or I understand those things. I I fail to understand how when opposition comes, how people will leave leave Christianity, let's say it that way, how they will leave Christianity and say, well, if this is what God stands for, I want nothing about it. Do you know why? Do you know why they say that? Because they don't know their why. They don't know their why. Why did you give your life to the Lord? Why did you get saved? Why do you follow Jesus? Why should he be the Lord and Saviour of all of your life? Why should he be that? And why would you allow him? Oh, goodness me, why do you give? Why do you bother giving money away and and giving an offering to the Lord when, when things are obviously so tight in your finances? Why should you do all this? The better your why, the better your way. The clearer your why, the clearer your way. Uh, last week, we had the Super Bowl on. When I watch the Super Bowl, I don't understand American football. I've played a social game of it. 
didn't understand it then. And uh, all I did was, okay, this is what we're going to do. It's a mapping out where you're going to be. It's nothing like rugby league, Marie. Some people like it. I can't see the point of it, but they like it. Tom Brady this year won his seventh Super Bowl. Super Bowl ring. He's seventh. That's two more than the next person. The achievement that he's done is quite amazing. Uh, what makes it more so is in rugby league, they say you, you turn into a super coach once you bring it. Uh, it's not just winning premierships with a team. It's once you can win a premiership with another team. And that's what brought Wayne Bennett into the super coach class because he won with the Broncos and won with St. George. And so for Tom Brady to do this and winning at two clubs, this is what they said about Tom Brady. He was possibly the worst athlete in his family. His high school team sucked. His college coach didn't rate him as a footballer. I bet you he's chewing on his own words. He could have played baseball. After playing college football at Michigan, at Michigan, Brady was selected. So here's a vote of confidence. They have a draft system, you get picked. Brady was selected 199. Woohoo! Talk about being a favourite. Not. 199th by the Patriots in the sixth round of the 2000 NFL draft. He was earning the reputation as the draft's biggest steal. Now, not only was he 199th in the pick, <laughs> he was picked sixth. He wasn't first, second, third, fourth, fifth. He was the sixth pick. Now, we're going to have you, 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 you. Uh, okay, we'll pick you now. Talk about a vote of confidence. But Tom Brady knew his why. He knew his why. He wanted to win a Super Bowl. That was it. That was his why. In rugby league talk, probably in the modern era, post the St. George and South games of the early days when there weren't enough teams. But in the modern era, did you know Kevin Walters, our new Brisbane Broncos coach, has won six premierships, more than any other player. Six premierships. He knew his why. He understood the why of what he was doing. So often I think we look at our why as, well, it's what's going to make me happy. What will I be happy in? I've got to get my head used to the new time. In 2 Chronicles 1, chapter 1, verse 7, we have the story of King Solomon. And Solomon receives a dream from God and God tells him to ask for anything. Solomon, as we know, asks for wisdom. Solomon is a new king, and getting the throne wasn't easy. It took work from his mother, Bathsheba, and it took work from Nathan the prophet. His father, King David, is still alive when he gets handed the throne. He's got to deal with a brother, Adonijah, who went around in his chariot and proclaimed that he was the king. Solomon was also charged by his father to deal with Joab and Shimea for the treachery and the things that they did. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 1, Solomon declares that he's faced with leading a people as numerous as the dust of the ground. We see right there, just in that passage, the fulfillment of what God promised Abraham. As numerous as the dust of the ground. The Bible says that because of God's love for David, God goes to Solomon and tells him, ask anything you want. Ask for anything. And as a 20-year-old king, he could have asked for a lot. He could have asked for wealth, and God would have given it. He could have asked for fame, and God would have given it. He could have asked for long life, the Bible says, and God would have given it. Yet somehow Solomon declares that he is overwhelmed in his place and privileged to be in this position, obviously feeling underqualified to lead this numerous great people. If God, in God's name, and he asks for wisdom and knowledge. The reason that Solomon, the, the reason why Solomon asks God for this, the reason he asks for this is what gets God's attention. God saw Solomon's why. 
God saw in the heart of Solomon that this is so massive, I have to place myself in this corner here where I am totally reliant on you and there's nothing I can do. Give me wisdom and understanding to lead this people through. This year, Seal and I celebrate our 37th wedding anniversary. 37 years. <laughs> I won't make a joke. 37 years. Thank you. Are we married long? I've married longer already than anyone else in my family. If I want a better marriage, I need to know my why. Because if my marriage has lost its why, it'll lose its way. If I want my wife to change so it makes me happy, that's not a good why. If I want my wife to listen to me so I can have peace, it's not good enough why. If I want my wife to do what I say so I feel better about myself, I should have married another woman. <laughs> she tells, she, sorry, I'm saying that wrong. Seal gives me the blunt truth because that's what I need. If it's not about love, I haven't got my why. We stand before God and all these witnesses where we declare our vows and our love to each other. I'm amazed at families, at people there was someone in the news last week after 36 years of marriage, just pfft, marriage, falling apart. Just gave it away. I don't understand how people could be married for 20, 30, 40 years and they say, I'm done. I don't understand that. I think somewhere along the, light, the way, they lost their why. Why did you get married to each other? Because we fell in love. We fell in love. There was a couple. <laughs> this is none of this on the notes. There's a couple that we knew. We were going to youth, and there was this friend of ours, and um, he was uh, in youth. We were in the church building, and he was just following his girlfriend around like this sick puppy dog. Oh, it was disgusting. And he was just following her around, and she'd sit there, he'd move, she'd go here, and he'd move, she'd move over there, and she was just following her around everywhere. And I remember saying, oh, Oh, please, I hope I wasn't like that. And uh, the best Sunday school teacher in the business said to me, oh, Harold, you were worse. <laughs> you were worse. I was in love. I was in love. If you want a better relationship with your kids, you need to know why. You need to know your why. You know what is not a why when it comes to our kids? I learned this one the hard way. Because I said so is not a why. <laughs> can make you feel good at the time, but it's not a why. Our kids are not ours. They belong to the Lord. As parents, we will have to give an account before God what we did with our children, why we spoke to them the way we did. How did we raise them? Did we tell them and speak to them about the things of the Lord? Did we show them? Do our children see, do our children see Christ in us? Because I said so is not good enough. I grew up in a house where it was because I said so. I grew up not just in a house, culturally. In a Dutch Indonesian, in an Indo culture, because I said so was all you needed and all you got. And I learned it wasn't enough because there was something that superseded culture, and that was my relationship with Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 12, we see the story of the Pharisees and the Herodians trying to catch out Jesus. And they say to him, teacher, um, in verse 14, when they come to him, teacher, we know that you are true and care about, and care, Teacher, we know that you are true and care about no one, for you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God and his truth. 
Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? What shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, Jesus, knowing the hypocrisy, said to them, Why do you test me? Bring a denarius that I may see it. So they brought it. And he said to them, Whose image whose, and whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar. And in verse 17, Jesus answered, said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are of God. And they marveled at him. Our children are made in the image of God. Render to God that belongs to God. Our children are made in his image. And we have a responsibility as caretakers of our children to present them before the Lord, to pray over them, to speak blessing upon them. Because one day they will return back to their maker and what condition will they be in? Will they see your image or will they see God's? Will the Father see his image? So I ask again, why do you love Jesus? Why are you a Christian? Why do you believe that why do you believe what you believe? Why do you do what you do? Of course we all know the answer. Because he loves me. John 3:16. For God so loved the world. For God so loved me. For God so loved Harold. For God so loved Beck. For God so loved Andrew. For God so loved Krista. For God so loved Jenny that he sent his son and said, I've got a son who'll pay the price for you. I've got a son who'll do anything. Why? Because I love you. I love you. I love you. God is saying, I love you. And so often in our Christian walk and people walk away and walk out of church and they leave things, it's because they never got their why right. Their why was, what program are we doing? Their why was, does the church have this ministry that can fulfill my need? Their why was, how are we gonna do evangelism? Their why was, is the worship team good enough? Their why was, can they actually sing in tune? Their why was, is it gonna sing the songs that I like listening to? Their why was, will the pastor preach the message that I'm gonna like? Their why was, will it be able to fulfill my emotional needs and will it make me happy? And if that's the fruit of your why, it's warped. It'll be warped because there is no other why. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you on a, a secret. Listen, do you want to know a secret for anyone who's young? See, I love doing what I'm doing. And I'm absolutely privileged that God has chosen me. But let me tell you a secret. Marie would know this. You would not be a pastor if the Lord didn't ask you to do it. You just wouldn't do it. You wouldn't enter ministry if God didn't say to do it. But if you've entered into the call of God and the work, Andrew, you'd know this too. If you enter into the call of God and the things that he has for you, if you do not have your why right, you will fail. You'll fail. Things will come against you because your why has been, is, and should always be because he loves me. Because he loves me. Because he loves me. I live for his great name. The old has passed away and all things are new because he loves me. That he speaks to me because he loves me. He whispers to me because he loves me. When I pray to him and I feel like I'm hitting a wall, he doesn't get angry with me. He doesn't run away. He doesn't leave me. He just waits there till I can sort out this soul that is fighting. And then he whispers, hey, how's it going? I really believe this is the issue. So much in our lives, we haven't got our why right. And I want us to get our why. See, it's not a simple question. It is a simple question and not a simple. I get, the, I get the, the shift in this because people are working out what it is. Well, I, I want to be a Christian, but I don't know if I want to do all this other stuff. Then don't. But fall in love with him. I want to be a Christian, but I don't know about all this ministry and doing all these things. I don't know if that's me. Then don't but fall in love with him. 
Because everything you do in your walk flows out of your why. Everything you do flows out of your why. And my prayer is that God would show you a clearer why. A clearer why. Because in this why, he is faithful, he's true, he is just, he is encouraging, he heals, he comforts, he holds, he presents a way through. He is the one in this why who will lead you and hold you and guide you and bring you right through. You know, knowing your why will clear up the emotional turmoil in the soul. As Christians, we need to fix our soul. We need to fix our soul. And our soul is caught because we don't know our why. Our why is misplaced. Our why is misplaced. You know, the Bible talks, there are more scriptures that talk about happiness in the Bible than anything else. But when you look at those scriptures, it all has one theme. Do you know what that theme is? Have a guess. No. <laughs> being in God. It's being in God. If you want happiness, be in God. If you want peace, be in God. If you want breakthrough, be in God. It's learning that while we're in this column where it feels like rote, he's still with me. But be willing to stand in this column and go, oh Lord, I'm giving it all to you. I've got no choice. I'm handing it all over to you. Take control, Holy Spirit. Take control. Because you are my why. Can we stand this morning? Father, I thank you this morning for who you are. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are welcome in our place. That, Lord, you are our why. You are our why. And my prayer this morning is that people would have a greater, that we'd all learn to get a greater revelation of who you are for your great name, being enlarged in you. That Lord, all that you are would increase in us, that we would rest and trust in you. So I pray for all those here. I pray for those that need healing. And I bless your mighty name, for by your stripes, Lord Jesus, we are healed. I thank you, Lord, for all those that need a breakthrough this morning. And Lord, I thank you that you are the light for the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and you delight in his ways and though we fall, we will not be cast down. That I thank you, Lord, that you uphold us. And I thank you that your word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path, that you will shine right through every breakthrough needed, everything that is opposing, Lord. We take every thought captive and we cast it down and we speak life this morning. We speak life this morning. And Lord, we just commit this day to you. And Lord, we praise you in all your mighty name that we can celebrate in you in everything that we are. And Holy Spirit, let loose, let loose, have your way. Have your way in our lives. We pray over our children. We pray over our loved ones. We pray over those that don't know you. And Lord, let them have an encounter with you that they would see the supernatural power of your amazing, amazing love because your love never fails. Thank you, Lord. We commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen.